very first webinar in Christians Aware, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy that our first speaker, because we hope we will do more of these, is our new chairman, Bishop John Porumbaloth, who is the Anglican Bishop of Bradwell. We have many things in common, and it is very creative that we've been able to attract you to join as our chair. Thank you for that. Um, people may like to know that Bishop John was brought up in the ancient church of the Syrian Orthodox tradition in South India, which we have so much to learn from. I have visited the church there, and I went to the uh, theological college as well. There's so much we can learn from what is going on. But also, it's lovely to think that you've come from one ancient tradition to another in Bradwell, because Bradwell had a Roman fort and then a monastery founded in the seventh century by Sed. But I think having said that, that the Syrian Orthodox Church was there before any of that. It was very early and traditionally founded by Thomas the Apostle. So we're very privileged. We're privileged because you're from India as well. Our first visit to India, if we can all believe this, was in 1982, which is a very long time ago now. And we went with a group to the Young Men's Welfare Society in Calcutta. And they had a lot in common with us also, working in an interfaith way in the slums, in education and healthcare. I love Calcutta. I love going there. And I'm so impressed always by the problems there are and the way people tackle them. So we learn from India and we're hoping to learn from Bishop John as our chairman now and in the future. We have a lot in common. We have India in common. I think you were ordained into the Church of North India. Yes. And of course, Christian Square is an ecumenical educational charity. Um, so again, we have things we can learn from there, from what goes on in the Church of North India. We are um, part of that. I see ourselves as part of that. And the Church of South India as well. It's so uh, wonderful that we can learn from you from your interests in multiculturalism, interfaith issues and ecumenism. All of those are important issues for us in Christians Aware. We've published books and we include all of these things in our magazine, which is regular four times a year. So we look forward to your talk now and we look forward to future life and work together. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for the good words. Uh, yes, I do share a lot with you uh, between Kerala, Calcutta and England. Um, as I start, I was just remembering um, a conversation I had with one of my incumbents when I was Archdeacon of Barking. Um, in her congregation, uh, there were two congregations basically in her parish. One spoke English, which was a smaller congregation. The other congregation spoke an Indian language. Uh, and they were probably the bigger congregation. So I spoke to uh, this priest saying that uh, we need to make sure that we are one congregation and we need to make sure that there is provision for uh, people speaking other language to be articulating their faith in their way. Uh, so he said, oh, Father, that's right, but I am trying to do, um, I'm trying to, uh, to, to imagine heaven. 
where we all speak in one language. So I said, that is true, but you made an assumption there. You made an assumption that in heaven, we will all be speaking English. So that, that gives us probably the kind of picture how we approach others. We think our culture, our language has some kind of primacy or privilege. And even the well-meaning Christians could actually be explicating something that is very dangerous in the conversations. Recently, we had Black Lives Matters uh, movement. And in Essex, many people actually said, no, all lives matter. That is fine. I started wondering if Jesus appeared today and he said, blessed are the poor, you will say, Lord, that is wrong. Blessed is everyone. You shouldn't say blessed are the poor. So these are the kind of conversations you hear in your normal life in any part of this country. So I just want actually to introduce the theme with that behind us, those particular experiences behind us. Why do I say intercultural, not multicultural? Probably we need to know three, three kind of approaches. The first is monocultural. When it is monocultural, one culture take the domineering role. And the dominant culture expects other cultures to assimilate. So you say that you need to assimilate, you need to integrate into this culture. So that is monoculturalism. One culture is dominant and that culture expects every other culture to be assimilated into the dominant culture. It might recognize other cultures, but the expectation is that they are all inferior and this is the normal one. But then we move on to multicultural. Being multicultural means you celebrate racial and um, cultural differences. You like them, you stand alongside one another, but not being influenced or not able to influence others. So it is a kind of peaceful coexistence of different cultures. And then we move to intercultural, which I think is probably our calling being intercultural is coming together to learn from one another, to influence each other, giving equal value and power to each culture. So that is actually the journey I am talking about. We are in many contexts monocultural. In certain other church contexts, we are multicultural but we haven't yet become intercultural. And being monocultural could be very dangerous. I'll tell you one example. When I was uh, in my first incumbency parish, that is back in Calcutta, uh, it is an Anglo-Indian uh, community. Uh, and the Anglo-Indians are more Anglo than Indians. Uh, they speak English and you know, uh, the culture is more, more Western than Indian. So the churches follow more or less Western practices. I was doing a rehearsal for a wedding and my curate was with me too. So as we were going through the order of service, uh, the bride and the groom said, we come from South India. In our culture, we have, in addition to exchange of wedding rings, we have what we call Mangala Sutra. I don't know, some of you, I can see Vasandi actually in the gallery, you know, so there are others who will know what that is. Um, <clears throat> it's not just about exchanging rings. What you do is there is a kind of little locket 
which you will find actually attached to the chain for a married woman. So a married woman in that culture will normally have this Mangala Sutra. In Kerala, we call it Minna. It is just a heart-shaped locket with a cross in the middle. It's very small. So if you look at a woman in Kerala, and if you see the, 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 uh, the neck um, um, uh, uh, <coughs> chain, you will find Minna or Mangala Sutra. And that's how you recognize she's married. And that is normally tied around the neck of the bride by the groom in the wedding service. You take actually some strings out of the wedding sari and actually you tie it around and literally they call it tying the knot. That's how actually tying the knot is understood there. Really you make a knot. And then after the service, uh, the woman will uh, take that locket out of that string and put it to the chain. Uh, whatever chain she normally would be wearing. So I said, there's no problem. There is space for that in the service. My curate actually instantly responded, but father, that's not Christian. So I paused for a moment and asked him, David, where did you find in the Bible that you need to exchange rings? There is nothing about rings in the Bible. But we have made it a Christian practice because it is Western. Okay. So the Western practice is baptized as Christian. And so for an Anglo-Indian community who want to behave exactly like Western community, they have to follow Western customs. So that's what happens with monoculturalism. You expect everybody to assimilate into your culture and follow your practices and behavior. And an intercultural community, when it comes to church, is a covenant community. In, a, in that community, differences are received as gift. And boundaries are not very tight. Our boundaries are often very much tight. Rather than affirming the center, we go on defining our boundaries. So in this kind of covenantal community, which is intercultural, we accept the differences and the differences are received as gift. Diversity is not a problem to be solved, but it is a gift to be cherished and experimented and experienced and boundaries are not very tight. And members of that community have the competency of negotiating cultural sameness as well as differences. Both are important. You need to recognize the sameness as well as the differences. Color blindness doesn't help. If you're like me, sometimes it's not very helpful. So I think I have a problem with certain color combinations. I may need somebody's help actually to know what exactly is that shade. And to a greater extent in faith communities and in the church, we are very colorblind. And in this intercultural community where we are traveling together, each of us would be open to conversion. How the intercultural community was established. One of the examples would be Acts chapter 10, the, the whole conversation and the experience of Cornelius and Peter. At the end of the story, you need to ask the question, who was converted there? I would say Peter was converted as well as Cornelius. We all need that conversion. We need to journey together. So, so that's, that's the kind of introduction about interculturalism. I don't like isms, you know, but I, let me say intercultural, being intercultural. That's why I deliberately use that word rather than multicultural. And then secondly, in the title, I said the church, the church transcending 
racial and cultural divisions. The church with capital C, the church that God established, the church that the Spirit created at Pentecost. I'm not talking about the churches or denominations or congregations that we see around us. So we need to make that distinction. The church is created as an intercultural body, but the churches that we see are not yet intercultural. And that's where the, the difference between the church, God creates and creating and continue to create, and the churches that we are part of or we minister. So I want to go back to the Bible then, the church in the Bible. The first verse I would like to highlight is in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. In that short paragraph, Paul mentions mystery at least three times. A great mystery, the mystery of Christ. But what is that mystery? Paul explains it clearly. The mystery is that the Gentiles have become fellow heirs in the body of Christ. That is the mystery. The mystery about the church in Paul's understanding, and he says it is a revelation given to him, is that Gentiles have become fellow heirs in the body of Christ. But again, there is an interesting thing. When we speak about Gentiles, Many of us who are here in the West think about other cultures as Gentile cultures. I have heard many white people saying Gentiles without recognizing that biblically white people are also Gentiles. If you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. So whether you are white or black or brown, we are all Gentiles. Everybody gathered in this congregation now we are all Gentiles, but even there, we somehow identify ourselves with a biblical culture and then think that the dominant culture there is reflecting our culture. Again, a very dangerous tendency. It wasn't very easy for the Jews there or the Jewish Christians to be an intercultural body. That's where the Spirit of God had to do quite a lot of hard work. You know, all that debate between Peter and Paul, heated debates, disappointing experiences. But the Spirit worked. In the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, they come to a clearer understanding that the Gentiles do not need to follow Jewish customs. They can have their culture. It is acceptable. What we need to do is to live together, work together, grow together as one body. And that was the work of the Spirit. So the church was created as an intercultural body. It was the Spirit's work. We sometimes speak about Pentecost. There is a journey from Babel to Pentecost. You can interpret Babel and Pentecost in different ways, but probably I would say Babel is an example of multiculturalism, while Pentecost is about interculturalism. Babel is about being different, different cultures, and even they break down all the communication. But at Pentecost, you find what it means to be intercultural. You become one body, made into one body. So the early church was intercultural, but modern churches are not. Why? Why did that happen? Maybe the first thing is unintentionality. Unintentionality, there was no intention. The modern churches and the denominations were not established to serve other cultures. Like the Church of England, no? We were not actually created to serve other cultures. The mission emphasis actually came much later. So different denominations were formed in different contexts and it always reflected the dominant community and culture. Even the revival movements, 
the revival movement of Azusa Street, the Pentecostal movement. It was again a white organization. They kept black people away. And that's why then the, the, the ordinal church, the church of God was actually split into two. So, so all of these things are lack of intention. We were not fit for purpose because we were not created for serving others. We were created for a self-serving purpose to serve our community, our culture, and that's one reason. And that leads to building ethnic borders. We build ethnic borders. We define our boundaries and we are quite happy to go to other places like uh, you can send missionaries to Africa or India and create Christians there, but still they're not part of us. You keep them as separate church, separate group. If some of them came here, they are not accepted. So ethnic borders are then created. And when other communities appear here, particularly with the mid 20th century, you know, with the colonial kind of influence, we started getting people from other cultures uh, migrating into this country. That's when ethnic borders went up. Until then we were quite safe and secure. Then we started building ethnic borders and you find those borders still with us. And that then leads to racialization, racialization of society and racialization of the church. A racialized society is a society where race matters profoundly for differences in life experience and opportunities. When it comes to life experiences and opportunities, there is great difference for different racial groups. So that is a racialized society. And I would say we are a racialized society. And when the Archbishop of Canterbury said that the Church of England is institutionally racist, that's what actually he meant. We are a racialized society. Whether a person is racist or not, we belong to a particular organization which is institutionally racist. So it makes us to think and behave in a way that is not helpful for everyone. We are a racialized society. And we speak a lot these days about whiteness or white privilege or white supremacy. That, that's actually racialization. If you look at the criminal system in this country, policing, employment, you find that white privilege very much there. I remember one of my friends who was a first class um, uh, student, a scholar, both in Oxford and Cambridge, came out with MBA and further studies and with a PhD in social administration. She has a first name and a last name which look like English, but her middle name give, gives it all away. Her middle name is African. So she, she knew that she will get a job anywhere. So she deliberately put, she sent actually 10 applications in her first attempt for a job with a PhD in administration. In five of them, she put her full name, including the middle name. And for the other five, she only put her first name and the last name, which sounds very English then. No surprise, she was invited for interviews in all those places where she did not put her middle name. And she didn't get any invitation, any response from the other five places where she used her middle name. Because the middle name says she is not English. <laughs> that happens here. That happens in the church too. I had to rebuke many PCCs during shortlisting because they read the name and then actually they just make an assumption. So that racial superiority or racialization then results in everything that we do. In the church, two things are very important. One is the Bible. Second, our tradition and teaching. 
both are influenced by racialization. How do we read the Bible? We read the Bible with a particular background of imperialism, a, a, a feeling of being in the powerful side of the history. So we read the Bible from a position of power. While many of our guests in our congregations read from the position of weakness and even marginalization. So our racial understanding and our, our particular presuppositions help us to read the Bible in a particular way, which is not helpful for people who may not belong to our culture. They become very uncomfortable about our biblical interpretation. Secondly, our theology. We have done theology for last a few centuries as if our culture is actually the biblical culture. Everyone does theology, everyone has a context, nobody is neutral. We need to recognize that. But when you racialize everything, when you think that your culture is superior than everybody else's, you expect everybody to subscribe to your theology. So we have taught theology everywhere. I was a theology lecturer. I was a lecturer in a university in Calcutta. I taught theology, but most of what I taught was Western theology, which I thoroughly disagreed. So I had to actually then in, in some way deconstruct everything when I taught. I couldn't use many of the textbooks. So the textbooks are all uh, typical Western textbooks. It did not make any sense to a person who thought and read the Bible in a different context. And it comes across in our hymns, some of the hymns that we sing. I don't sing all the hymns, so if you see me not singing certain hymns when I visit churches or I attend services, it means that I don't agree with the wording. A lot of the hymns have got those particular imperialistic worldview. It seems that in those particular hymns, we have even interpreted the scripture in a particular way that will not be acceptable to many people in the world. So our theology is expressed in our hymns, our prayers, our liturgy. And that's where we find our, our whiteness, our white privilege, still sort of you know, dominant in the church life. I don't want to continue to speak for long. Um, maybe just give some indications where do we move from where we are, our journey ahead. If the church is called to be intercultural, and it was intercultural in God's creation, we need to be moving towards being intercultural. And what do we need to do? I, I can see certain shifts. We need to do some shift from one to another. The first shift I find needed is from secular to spiritual. From secular to spiritual. There are so many social theories that will help us. You can talk about all the requirements and all the all the justifications for being intercultural. But that is not enough. We are Christians. So we need to probably return to the Bible. And we need to reposition ourselves to read the Bible in a way that will be understood and experienced by people that we are in touch with today. So secular ideas might help. Social theories are great. But as Christians, we need to return to the Bible. So we need to find that spiritual basis for what we are doing. And even God, not just the Bible. I do passionately believe that God is biased. And nobody is neutral, even God is not neutral. And that is very clear in the scriptures. He's not very neutral. We have to defend the voiceless and God does that. We are called actually to give voice to the voiceless. So let us not play this neutrality. That is not a biblical game at all. So spiritual issue, and also the whole understanding of sin. Racism is sin. And we need to acknowledge that. 
It is not as a kind of social issue. It is a spiritual issue because it is sinful to be racist. To look down on somebody created in the image of God is a sinful act. My second shift is from tweaking to transformation. We are very good in tweaking things, no? We tweak a little bit here and there, you know, a kind of quick solution, um, make some changes. Okay, include a hymn from Nigerian background in the service, no? Because there are a lot of Nigerians in our congregation. So let them sing a song, you no, know, during communion, no? So we have that kind of tweaking, just to accommodate a few people here and there, or let them do a reading in their language. That is tweaking. We need to move from tweaking to transformation. We need to be transformed as a community so that we are equals. And, and the third will, will be from accidental to alignment. Accidental to alignment. We do things by accident. Recently, I heard people talking about my appointment as a bishop as something very radical. Okay. So something happens and then we take the credit. Oh, yes, no, we have done this. Something happens by accident. Someone actually breaks through the ceiling and actually appeared somewhere. And then, oh, great. That is accidental. So some appointments are in that way, not very intentional. It happens because maybe the person is qualified anyway and he gets appointed to something. And then we make that kind of token. Oh, the church has done something great. See, we have got actually a brown bishop and a black bishop, no? A black bishop south of the river and a brown bishop in the north of the river. Great, no? That's what I call accident, no? Some tokenism. Okay, put some people here and there. Acknowledge something that has already happened. We need to move from being accidental to alignment. We need to align ourselves with the whole movement of the spirit. So that there is a kind of level playing field for everyone in the church. The fourth movement is for us as the people of God is moving from the position of host or settlers to sojourners. We are sojourners. We have this tendency of thinking that we have already arrived somewhere in our journey. So we become host and everybody else is a guest. And that language is still used in the church. So we are, we are host, we are hosting it. Who are you to host it? It's God's church. So we need to move from being host or settlers to being sojourners and pilgrims and travelers. We all are traveling. One of the verses actually I keep remembering and, and reminding people about is from Deuteronomy. Uh, that, that the the well-known passage that comes with the Sheva with the Israelites are supposed to recite you know, almost every day. And that particular phrase where it says, my father was a wandering Aramean. My father was a wandering Aramean. If we all can remember that, our ancestors were wandering Arameans. They were journeying. They never settled. And they kept moving on. And we Christians and the disciples of Christ are also called to be travelers and pilgrims. We are journeying with Christ. We haven't arrived anywhere. And if we can understand that, that might probably help in dealing with others or relating to others, building bridges. We haven't arrived anywhere. Going back to the example of Peter in Acts chapter 10, Peter thought he had arrived somewhere. And Peter expected Cornelius or anybody else to travel to his place in his terms. But the spirit had to intervene. Peter had to go and meet Cornelius where Cornelius was. Not the other way around. Who was the host there? It was Cornelius. 
And who was converted? Both. And that's probably it's the experience the church should actually have. We should not be talking about being settlers and being host. We are travelers and we will continue to travel with God's people. And we can't even talk about minority anymore. I have started using the expression global majority. What we call minority ethnic are global majority people. White Christians are minority. And, and we need to just recognize that. There are nearly three, four million people or five million people who go to church in this country. Most of them, not very regularly in any case. But even a small church in India will have more than five million people going regularly to church. Or the church in Nigeria or Kenya will have millions and millions, you know. And still we, we call them sort of minority, okay? as if they are sort of minority. So we need to probably even look at our own terminology. In many churches in London, minority ethnics are not actually minority. They're majority. When I was an archdeacon of Barking, I remember some of my congregations there were majority from global majority communities. But still the leadership was in the, in the safe hands of few white people. No? We won't normally give that up easily. No? So, so this, there is a journey we have to actually make. Probably I will leave it there. No? I have a tendency to go on speaking and particularly when I don't have a script, no? um, I, I can go on talking. I think I will just pause there.